Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome Dr. Bruce Betts to the show. He is the Chief Scientist and Light Sail Program Manager for the Planetary Society. We'll be talking about near-Earth objects and how we might protect our world from potentially hazardous asteroids and comets. But first, we're going to journey back almost 75,000 years to a time when the Toba volcano erupted, wiping out much of the human population at the time. Then we look up at our planetary companion, the moon, as it visits the night, as it pays visits in the night sky to four planets of our solar system throughout the month. And we're going to tell you just how to see it all happen. Plus, we get an inside look at an upcoming book about one of NASA's most inspiring figures ever. Katherine Johnson. Finally, before welcoming Dr. Betts to the show, we learn about a solar eclipse that's taking place this week that is really for the snowbirds. The genetic code of humans reveals our species suffered a massive population loss roughly 75,000 years ago. At the time, in what would become Indonesia, the Toba volcano erupted, resulting in the formation of vast quantities of sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere of Earth. New computer simulations reveal the extent of the effects of this eruption, finding massive environmental damage could have resulted in widespread cooling of oceans, crop failures, and disease running rampant around the globe, wiping out much of the human race. The moon is going to put on quite a show this month, making close encounters in the sky with Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Look in the western sky just after sunset on June 11th to see Venus and the moon huddling up close together. Two days later, our planetary companion appears to meet up with Mars a little bit after sunset. Then a supermoon called the Strawberry Moon shines on the night of the 24th. The last few days of the month we'll see Jupiter and Saturn near the moon late at night. So make sure to journey outside and take a look at our planetary companion visiting four planets of the solar system all throughout June. For more details, visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. When NASA first reached the moon with a crewed mission, the success was due in no small part to the work of Katherine Johnson, an African-American NASA mathematician who used her love of mathematics to help safely guide us to the lunar surface. A new book, The Human Computer, Katherine Johnson's Story, is currently planned. We talk with Alessandro Petrino, owner of Quaternion Books, to talk about this tribute. So, can you just tell us a little bit about why he chose Katherine Johnson to write about? 
Yeah, so Catherine Johnson uh, was one of these uh, um, African-American mathematicians and uh, that was working for NASA uh, behind the scenes. You might know her from the movie Hidden Figures. Um, and uh, she was doing the calculations that NASA used to, uh, you know, that to, to perform the several uh, great achievements like uh, the Apollo 11 mission, the first uh, trajectory around Earth from uh, um, John Glenn, the first American in space like, John, like uh, Shepard, and all the main uh, missions and achievements of the space program. And Katherine Johnson was one of these women working um, for, for NASA behind the scenes. And we chose her because she's really a great example of, uh, um, of, of these people that have made history without being really uh, in the front lines, let's say, without being uh, um, seen. So, and uh, we try to focus mostly on her work rather than on her life, because her life has been already showed and displayed and celebrated in many different uh, um, ways, including the movie. So we were trying to bring to the public what it means uh, to, to work as Katherine Johnson. What, what did she really uh, do in, a, in her daily work? Right, and most people probably know her from, of course, the book, which was fabulous, and the movie Hidden Figures. How does, how does this work compare to that film and that book? Uh, so the book uh, contains uh, several different parts. There's one part which is a, a biography of her, a new biography that we are preparing, where we try to reconstruct a bit the historical development of, uh, of um, you know, her achievements. And then we focus on the reports that she wrote for NASA. So we reproduced her reports, which right now are public domain, so one can find them on the NASA website, but they're just typewritten really, do you see bad figures, you know, really sloppy because the scan is not really good. So we remade them. And then we asked some professional astrophysicists to comment and provide, provide uh, an explanation on the meaning of this, uh, um, this report, because of course, for the general public, this might be a bit hard to grasp. So if you read directly the reports of Catherine Johnson and Coltus. And so we have an explanation of every single step that uh, she performs in her calculations and in the reports. And so one can follow very easily uh, this, uh, this, uh, the, 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 you know, the development of the mathematical uh, solution of a problem that she was, uh, was trying to, to solve. That's great. And you guys just kicked off a Kickstarter campaign for that. Where can people learn more about that and about the book in general? Yeah, so we just, uh, we're just trying to achieve our goal to reach uh, the, the funding necessary to produce the book. And uh, our campaign uh, is right now live on Kickstarter and uh, will end on the 19th of June. And we have um, provided, we provide all the information necessary beside the Kickstarter website, also on our website, which is quaternionbooks.com. And um, yeah, so... If, if anyone is interested, we, uh, you know, we, we, we really much appreciate your uh, uh, help. Great. Thanks so much, Alessandro. Great talking with you. Thanks to you, James. A ring of fire will be seen in skies over much of Canada and Eastern Asia on June 10th as an annular solar eclipse forms in the early morning sky. Sky gazers in the northeastern United States will see a partial eclipse taking place for just about an hour, beginning around 5.30 local time. Northern Europe will see about 30% of the sun covered by the moon during the late morning hours British summer time. Please make sure to wear certified Mylar glasses to safely view the eclipse. Next up, we talk with Dr. Bruce Betts, Chief Scientist for the Planetary Society, about protecting our world from potentially hazardous objects in space. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, 
We are delighted to be joined by Dr. Bruce Betts. He is the Chief Scientist and the Light Sail Program Manager at the Planetary Society. We're going to be talking with him about uh, near Earth objects, asteroids, and planetary defense. Welcome to the show, Bruce. Thanks. Great to be here. Thank you. So can you just give us a brief rundown of the types of dangers that Earth might face from space? What's out there and how screwed are we? <laughs> <laughs> well, I like to say it's uh, one of those dangers in terms of asteroid impact that you shouldn't lose sleep over, but you also should do something about. They are uh, few and far between the dangerous impacts, but they they do and they will happen unless we prevent them. And uh, one's on the scale of the Tunguska event in 1908 that leveled 2000 square kilometers of forest in Siberia, where fortunately no one was. Those are happening every, on average every few hundred years, but you can't check off what, what they could be one day after another and then nothing for 2000 years. So uh, we've got a lot of small stuff out there that can hit us. We, in fact, we get tiny stuff that's not dangerous every night. That's what makes meteors. There's 100 tons of material hits the Earth every every day. But it's the larger things, the things that are over, say, 30 meters in size, but even smaller can do damage. So in night, uh, 2013, in Chelyabinsk, Russia, uh, there was an airburst of a roughly 18-meter object, and that was enough to shatter windows and injure about 1,000 people. Uh, if you go farther back in time, if you go way back, 66 million years ago, it's uh, a much, much, much larger 10 to 15 kilometer object is what wiped out the dinosaurs and 70% uh, of all the species on Earth, or at least that's what triggered it. So it's a very real issue. It's a very real threat, uh, particularly the so-called city killer asteroids, ones that would take out a city like uh, Tunguska event. Uh, but it's one that happens rarely, so it can be hard to get people to focus on it. The really great news is it's one of, it's the only large-scale natural disaster that we really can prevent with enough effort. And uh, we're getting there, but there's a long way to go. Hmm. So, of course, the first step to doing anything about it is to find them. So what are we doing to help see these asteroids? Well, that's exactly right. You can't uh, you, you can't save yourself if you don't know the dangers there. And so the the main focus right now, so to speak, should be on finding them. And uh, there are most of them now are found by three, soon to be four, professional surveys funded by NASA. But even once you find them, it doesn't do you any good to know it's out there if you don't know if it's going to hit Earth. And so to get that, you need multiple observations to build up an orbit prediction. And that is both the follow-ups of the surveys, but also amateurs and professionals around the world who dedicate themselves to getting more uh, observations. And then uh, eventually you want to characterize the asteroids to figure out what they're made of, what, <clears throat> excuse me, whether what appears to be one is actually two is a binary asteroid. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's a lot being done. We, we only knew of uh, a, very, a handful of, of near-Earth asteroids, say, 30 years ago. Now we know over 25,000. Uh, but we think there are about a million that are actually capable of uh, being city killers that are out there. So uh, we at Planetary Society are pushing very hard for a new NASA mission that's kind of in formulation stage, which should be a space telescope, an infrared space telescope, which is what you really want. You put it inside the orbit of Earth, you do observations with that, and you can really pick up the, the finding uh, aspect of things. So speaking of spacecraft, we are now at an exciting point in our history of, as a species um, of being close to sampling asteroids for the first time, the Cyrus-Rex and Hayabusa do uh, missions. Can you tell us what is what what are you able to learn about uh, about objects like this 
from those missions and others like it. Yeah, the interesting thing about asteroids, or there are many interesting things, one, the danger we've talked about, but scientifically, they're particularly interesting because they are typically remnants of the early solar system formation. So places like Earth and Mars have been, Earth and Mars have been heavily uh, modified by everything on Earth from plate tectonics to erosion, whereas on asteroids, you're pretty much got what you had four point six billion years ago when the solar system formed. So one, you're learning about the early solar system. Two, by studying these, we're learning more about how we could deflect them when we need to. And so what their physical makeup are. There are some that are solid metal. They're really even more dangerous if they come in. And then there are ones that are so-called rubble piles. And that's what Osiris Rex and Hayabusa too, their target asteroids basically are rubble piles. They're loose collections of lots and lots of rocks and boulders. And how you go about deflecting those ends up being different in the two cases. So uh, we now will have three, uh, three asteroid sample return missions. Hayabusa was the first, and now Hayabusa two and OSIRIS-REx. So it's, uh, it's an exciting time in asteroid science and also planetary defense. Hmm. So in April, um, NASA and some other organizations uh, put together a tabletop exercise simulating an asteroid coming in with six months warning. And spoiler alert, it did not end well for Eastern Europe. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it did not. How, how could we prepare for such a scenario? Uh, well, first, just a little reflection. That's part of the Planetary Defense Conference, which Planetary Society is a primary sponsor, happens every two years, moves around the world. This year was virtual, of course, and it includes this exercise as well as having experts in all, all sorts of types of asteroid defense. And this year, the creators of the scenario really challenged things by giving six months warning. So that is what you don't want. Obviously, you don't want even shorter than that. This is, once again, what puts the emphasis back on finding. If we can find things and track them and know their orbits and get 10, 20, 30, 40 years warning, then you have a lot of options of what you can do. You just need to move that asteroid a little tiny bit over many, many years, and it will miss Earth. But if you have a good-sized asteroid, as they did in the simulation, and you've got six months, you really don't have much option. It's hard to even, it's nearly impossible except with that incentive to make a spacecraft that you could get out there in that amount of time. Typical spacecraft development is at least three years. And you're largely forced into a nuclear option where you use a nuclear weapon to either uh, deflect it by rapidly melting the outside of one side or try to disrupt it, break it up. But it, it's, a, it's a difficult problem and the way we deal with it, the most practical way is emphasize the finding, get the space telescopes, get more observations, more characterization. And secondarily, try to come up with, I mean, ideally you'd have something on call to deal with such uh, issues, but considering spacecraft and rockets and their cost and the political issues of nuclear weapons, I think our most practical thing over the coming years is find things and get lots of warning. Mm. If you have to find it, then you <clears throat> don't have to, you know, pack Bruce Willis and a couple of thermonuclear weapons into a surprisingly overcharged, overpowered uh, space shuttle to <laughs> blow the thing up. <laughs> yeah, there's no shortage of what do you do? Well, where's Bruce Willis? But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, not the. You, Probably not the direction you would go. Uh, the the Armageddon movie of uh, the late '90s was uh, well. Let's just say it had a few technical errors, a few hundred. Uh, <laughs> might say that. Um, and we have a uh, radar question from Luke in Antony, France, uh, who asks, "What sort and kinds of investments should society be making in?" in protecting ourselves from near-Earth objects? 
Uh, well, I think the, the big investments are, of course, going to come from the space agencies. And so far, it's largely been NASA, who does have the largest budget, uh, and also the European Space Agency, and to a lesser extent, uh, the Japanese space agencies and others. But I think, uh, to, to reiterate, I think the uh, focus on a, a survey mission that's a infrared telescope in orbit, uh, closer to Venus orbit, is going to be the most effective and most important thing. Now, what's also important is to increase investment in the finding, tracking, characterizing. Uh, we Planetary Society tries to do its part with Shoemaker Near Earth Object Grants, where we award grants that are relatively small but make significant differences for amateurs around the world upgrading their equipment to do characterization and to do follow-up. Uh, but I it basically, the simple answer is more investment in planetary defense. The complex answer is in the finding the different aspects. Now, another thing that's coming up, which we could use more of, is a demonstration of a deflection technique for the first time on an asteroid, and that's the DART mission scheduled to launch in the near future, NASA DART mission that will uh, try the kinetic impactor, which is the old just hit it with a spacecraft as hard as you can, and see how you change its orbit. Mm. And I mean, and of course, I one of my favorite things that the Planetary Society is doing right now is is work on light sails. Yes. You, and every time you mention light sails somewhere, Bill Nye's ears perk up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, could, yes, could he's light got the sail... he's got the warning. <laughs> so like could... the bad signal, the Bill signal. <laughs> Um, where, I mean, is it possible to use light, light sails to deflect asteroids or other potentially hazardous objects given enough warning? It is, and it, along with many other ideas, have been considered. It's not the, probably not the most practical way. Uh, we're flying a light sail mission, light sail two, right now, using solar mm -hmm. uh, solar photons to propel the spacecraft. And solar sails, light sails have all sorts of applications, but planetary defense, in terms of actual deflection, not the easiest or most practical thing. In terms of in terms of characterization and visiting asteroids, it's great because you don't require fuel and you can visit multiple asteroids and just keep picking new asteroids while you're out there as long as your spacecraft works if you're in the right area of space. And in fact, NASA's NEA scout, Near Earth Asteroid Scout, which should launch the next year or so, is going to go do a flyby of a Near Earth asteroid. So they're helpful on that side, but not as much for deflection. Um, the, the deflection of asteroids most popular ideas are nuclear if you're out of time, but obviously has a ton of political issues that you want to avoid. And Bruce Can Willis isn't already booked. I know he's doing so many movies; it's hard to it's hard to get him. So that's why you do the kinetic impactor that I just mentioned, and mm -hmm. also there are even slower techniques like the so-called gravity tractor, where you use the little tiny tiny gravity of a spacecraft to divert a an asteroid you just but it takes years and years to do it and there are other techniques planetary size funded something called laser bees where you would use lasers to vaporize a side of the asteroid and push it a different way there are ideas using solar sails to changing reflectivity uh, but i'd say right now the three main consider techniques are gravity tractors we have lots of time kinetic impactors for kind of medium range and then nuclear either uh, deflection or disruption if you were stuck with nothing else to do. <laughs> and finally, uh, how can people who are, you know, as you said in your fantastic course about planetary defense, the, the dinosaurs made the mistake of not having a, not having a space program. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so how exactly. can people who don't want us to go the way of the dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> you know, help out. How can they learn more about about you know, these programs? Well, you can go to planetary.org, planetary.org slash defense, and that is a planetary society site, independent international nonprofit that we are. 
And uh, there you can find everything from my course, which is just about an hour long and, and involves a number of dinosaurs that help me out. Uh, you can also find infographics, information, frequently asked questions, videos, uh, and the like. So it's a good place to start. Uh, if you really want to get involved, you can consider supporting the Planetary Society's uh, Shoemaker Near Earth Asteroid Program, which we're raising funds for another round of grants right now to go to amateur and professional astronomers around the world to take their observatories and move them to the next level. And this is one of the few areas of space science where amateurs, really advanced amateurs, make a significant contribution. So that's where I'd start. Of course, you can find other resources from NASA and ESA and the like out there about, uh, about this uh, issue. That's great. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Bruce. It was great talking with you. Thank you very much for inviting me. This was great. Fabulous. And that was Dr. Bruce Betts, Chief Scientist and Light Sail Program Manager at the Planetary Society. Next week, we're going to be joined by Dr. Noah Petro. He is NASA's Project Scientist for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And we'll be talking about exploring the lunar surface, the Artemis missions, and the return of humans to the moon. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before the general public. How do we do this? We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or really any major podcast provider, even some of the minor ones. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.